So, no doubt you've been following a little bit of what's been going on uh, in the Middle East, in Iran, particularly as drones have struck um, a number of locations. But um, in partic- one in particular interest that we've focused on a bit is uh, this um, uh, ammunitions factory uh, location in Isfahan, Iran. Um, there is still no official comment from Israel that they are responsible for that drone strike, although uh, apparently, according to Reuters and other news sources, uh, a U.S. official, who I've not seen named yet, uh, has uh, basically said that the U.S. was not involved in it and said that this was actually carried out by uh, Israel. And so I don't think anyone's surprised by that, but there is no official confirmation of that from Israel as of the time of this recording. And so, um, so there's a lot of things that we don't quite know yet. We can surmise reasonably, but we don't actually have factual knowledge of a few things here. Um, there uh, has also been reports that this uh, that this uh, factory that was struck uh, was a place where they manufacture drones and significant amounts of them apparently for the Russian military as Iran has been supplying uh, these, uh, these drones to the Russian military in their conflict against uh, Ukraine. And so uh, as a matter of fact, one development this morning is that um, uh, Iran has uh, called in uh, one of the uh, Ukrainian diplomats for making comments about how the Israeli strike, uh, I don't know if he actually said the Israeli strike, but the drone strike on this factory in Iran was uh, directly involved in intervening in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And so he's been called in, I guess, to clarify uh, those comments or something like that. We'll see what happens with that. But I just thought today um, I, I would like to maybe just share a few thoughts, uh, especially for those who wonder why this is such a big deal. Uh, those who maybe are even interested in learning about biblical prophecy but see this and they don't really see how that connects. Uh, let me start by saying it, it may not actually develop into uh, the scenario that Ezekiel describes in chapters 30 and 39 of his prophecy. But one of these days, something like this will happen where it will. And so we just want to look at what's going on and see if it's lining up now or if it's maybe contributing to what will ultimately one day result in the fulfilling of that prophecy. So uh, required reading in this uh, topic is, of course, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, You might look at things like Psalm uh, 83. There's various passages in uh, Jeremiah that seem to potentially be, um, you know, emerging as pertinent. And so there's a few things that we want to look at. But let me just, for a few minutes, just talk about why this may matter now and why it's worth paying attention to. It's worth paying attention to because of the players involved primarily. Um, In Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is uh, a description of a number of nations who are referred to in Ezekiel by their ancient names, the names that they would have known these nations as at the time. We don't refer to them by these names anymore. But um, uh, although in some of your English translations, uh, a few of the names like Ethiopia and such were have been mentioned in the English translation, but in the Hebrew, uh, it is actually referring to the original names of these nations, uh, places like Cush and Put or Persia, speaking of Iran or uh, Sheba and Dedan, speaking of Saudi Arabia, these these places that we understand where they were in the times they were mentioned by Ezekiel, and by virtue of of knowing where they were then, we can see where those areas are now and what they're known as now. So, for example, the premier and primary player, uh, no pun intended, their premier, but the uh, primary player is a nation um, called Magog and is uh, led by a ruler called Gog, uh, which would essentially speak, uh, Magog would speak of the area of Russia. There's some debate as to whether it's maybe referring to Turkey. I happen to believe it's uh, referring more to the area that's known today as Russia. And so therefore Gog would be the premier or, you know, leader or czar or whatever of Russia. Uh, I, I use that a little bit loosely because for all practical intents and purposes, I'm fairly certain that's what Putin wants to be. But uh, as I've mentioned recently in, in, uh, in recent uh, posts about this, that If the scenario unfolded today, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 was upon us, Magog would mean Russia, and Gog would be speaking of Vladimir Putin. Uh, So I I always like to make sure I I emphasize that, because uh, it it helps us understand that the things that are spoken of there in Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, are events that will take place in real human history with real players who will be known by those who are around at the time it unfolds. Uh, I presume that will be us. I think we're living in the days that we'll see these things come to pass. And so 
So that being said, the players involved are significant, both in terms of who's currently kind of involved uh, and in terms of those who aren't at the moment. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to Ezekiel 38 for just a minute. And uh, there's a couple of passages here that um, I'll bring out, um, but I'll invite you to read the entire passage. Um, uh, so let me, just looking at what's going on here, there, there is general consensus, general belief, uh, I shouldn't say consensus, but the general belief is that Israel is responsible for these drone strikes on this Iranian, um, again, ammunition factory, location, warehouse uh, in Isfahan. So um, that's provocative for a number of reasons. Uh, it's provocative because, of course, it raises tensions again between Israel and Iran, Iran who... Uh, is is bent, and I, when I say Iran, I'm really specifically speaking of the leadership, both uh, uh, the Ayatollah and, of course, the president, but those who are in power in Iran, and some of the people, but not all of the Iranian people. I, I want to just too broadly brush that, but certainly the leadership uh, in terms of uh, political and also religious, they they long to see Israel expunged from the earth, and, and I, you can check me out on that. That's not overstating it. And so, um, when if Israel did in fact do this, uh, of course it's it's poking them in the eye a little bit, but it's not without good reason. By the way, uh, in recent days, just uh, uh, just a few days ago, there were uh, terrorist attacks in Israel where civilians were killed. It was brutal. It was terrible. Um, it was the it formed the main focus of of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, most recent cabinet meeting and and such. But um, but not only that. Uh, but there's also, of course, the threat of Iran developing, uh, you know, uh, ballistic missiles and, uh, and and developing nuclear capability to deliver those said missiles to do damage, of course, and, in, in an effort to wipe out Israel uh, as a people. And so um, Israel has a vested interest and even possibly a re- reciprocating interest in, uh, in, in this attack. Um, Israel's not going to abide Iran having a nuclear program. Uh, that's been made abundantly clear. And so uh, this may have been a move in that regard. As a matter of fact, some of the reports that are, or some of the speculation, at least at this point, I'm not sure it's been officially reported, uh, is that um, this factory or warehouse were, it was a, a facility where these missiles were being developed as well, not just drones, which was the primary belief of what was uh, being developed there, uh, drones. And so there, it's unclear, and again, we're, we're just laying out some of these things that are known so far, but I don't want to go far out on a limb, particularly on any of those things, until we have actual confirmation. I just think that's wise. I don't want to speculate too much. But, um, but that being said, if in fact, and it does, seem, it does seem to be a growing understanding that this was a facility where drones were made, why is that a big deal? Well, because Iran is currently supplying drones to Russia in Russia's conflict against Ukraine. So that begins to now broaden the scope a little bit. Again, this is why these things begin to matter and and how they begin to potentially touch on biblical prophecy. So, uh, and I emphasize potentially because it may not fully unfold this time around, but something like this, again, is going to precipitate uh, those events ultimately unfolding, as Ezekiel describes, at some point, if not this time. So, um, uh, so Iran is supplying drones to Russia, and Russia is using those drones in uh, her... Uh, attacks upon areas in Ukraine and that. And so um, it is thought that um, this is both a strike against Iran's capacity to fulfill her, uh, you know, uh, um, commitments in that regard to Russia. Uh, There was a comment by a Ukrainian diplomat that's been called in. I I think uh, Iran called in this diplomat and is calling for this diplomat to, to appear uh, to either clarify or justify the comments, um, but uh, the comments were made that this assault, this this uh, drone attack on uh, uh, this facility in Iran, was intended to sort of throw a wrench in things in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Now that's a little bit provocative because Israel, though not necessarily militarily helping out Ukraine, has emphasize that she sides with Ukraine in this conflict against Russia. Well, that again broadens the scope of this a little bit because Russia and Israel have sort of a tentative relationship too. 
Uh, and that is what begins to make this very interesting, is because uh, here, I'll just read the opening uh, verses of, of uh, Ezekiel 38. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. This is the leader of the land of Magog, which is Russia. Again, uh, there's some little bit of dispute about that, but uh, most, most prophecy people tend to see this as Russia. And the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, and put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Degarma, and the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land who's brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. Uh, they were brought out of the uh, nations, and all of them uh, now all of them dwell safely. And so we're told here, uh, and it continues on. But we're told here who the players are, and who they're coming against, and who they're led by when they come against. It is Russia leading a, a group of nations: Iran, Turkey. Um, it would seem parts of Eastern Europe in that uh, northeastern uh, Africa. Nations coming together around Israel and gathering under the leadership of Magog or Russia and her leader, um, you know, if, again, if it were today, it'd be Putin, um, coming down against Israel. But notice how it says that God is going to put hooks in the jaws of Gog, uh, this leader of this, of this horde of nations coming against Israel. The hooks in the jaw seem to imply that it is, uh, seem very clear, actually, that God is actually going to pull Russia into this conflict leading these other nations against Israel. Now, as, as the passage unfolds into and including chapter 39, we see a, a, uh, a variation of a phrase that is used very frequently throughout that. And this, to me, is why this is an exciting thing to be paying attention to. Uh, and that phrase, that expression, is that they may know that I am the Lord. Uh, again, this is a, a, as we just read, this is a taking place in the latter times. Israel and this, uh, and again, I'll encourage you to read Ezekiel 38 and 39 for a, a fuller sense of the whole picture there. But I'm just trying to be relatively brief in this, and I'm already kind of losing track of that. So, But that they may know that I am the Lord. God says that both to his own people. He acts on their behalf uh, that they may know he is the Lord. Now, this is significant, especially since this is said to occur in the latter times. Israel is back in the land, which we see as, as partly what's described in Ezekiel 37, 36 and 37. Um, they are back in the land, but unlike what is described in Ezekiel 37, which is why I believe Ezekiel 37 is a dual fulfillment, 36 and 37 ought to be read together, um, is that they are described on one hand as being in belief, but in 38 and 39, there seems to be hints that they're in unbelief. And so uh, I think as these passages unfold and we begin to understand that there's probably in play here, likely I believe there is in play, a dual fulfillment of these things. One would speak of the era of time that is pointed more toward the millennial period. But this period of time that Ezekiel 38 is talking about is a time when they're in Israel in unbelief and God is making sure that his people know that he is the Lord. Uh, they find themselves in a situation much like in 1948 before the nation, uh, on the cusp of it becoming a nation, uh, and as it became a nation, they recognized, even though they returned in unbelief, that they're clearly, and it was, I think, even, um, uh, was it Disraeli or... Um, uh, or Ben Gurion, actually, I think, who had said that he believed that there clearly was like a hand of providence involved in this, and, and or I forget exactly how he phrased it, but he was acknowledging that this we really should not have been able to have this victory. Something else must have been at play. Well, in the days we're living in now, uh, Israel is largely a secular nation, or at least a sort of reform Judaism, uh, not terribly um, committed to the you know to the living out the teachings of the Torah and, and all those kinds of things. 
And so that would be a significant move by the Lord to once again remind his people that they are his people and he is their God. But he also says that they may know I'm the Lord to the nations around. Now, I find this very interesting as well, because it implies that God is making sure to give a witness that he is the one intervening. Uh, This is significant for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is I think that has something directly to do with the world's embracing of Antichrist and basically seeing him as a god, as described in Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2, among other places. Uh, Daniel seems to give this indication that there is something um, really magnificent about this guy, and the world really props him up, and or not props him up, but really believes him, gets behind him. It's propped up actually by Satan or the dragon in, in Revelation 13 through 17, as we see. Um, uh, and, uh, and the false prophet is his partner in this, helping to bolster this religion around the Antichrist and that, not only that, but also an economic and political system. Well, I think in the conditioning of the world being ready to receive that man when he comes is going to be the idea that they will want him to, st- to be their representative standing against Christ when he returns. And we see that in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. So these are significant events. If, if in fact, and whenever it does happen, if it's not right now, when these things unfold, I think there's a direct link and sort of path being paved to Antichrist in this event in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which I think precedes Daniel's 70th week. I think it is a separate event that precedes it and precipitates the events of Daniel's 70th week. So um, so God is going to make sure the nations know he is the Lord. So that's one of the reasons why this is significant to watch and pay attention to and to get excited about, because uh, the rapture of the church, which I think could happen at any time, is not guaranteed to happen before Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens. So it may very well be that we're around to see that unfold. So if this happens in our day, then you and I are going to be privy to watching God's hand at work on behalf of his chosen people Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now again, that's a different period of time than what is described as Daniel's 70th week, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, particularly verse 27, where that final week, which has to do with Daniel and his his people and his holy city, uh, they become the focal point once again uh, in very profound ways, which I think is what is described throughout chapter 6 and 19 of the book of Revelation. So, but that again, we've talked about that previously. We'll no doubt talk about it many times again until the Lord comes for us. But that being said, You and I, as believers, and I'm hoping we're gone by then, but on the other hand, if we're here and we see those things happen, that's going to be a pretty dramatic thing to be watching. So, is this in fact Ezekiel 38 and 39? So far, it's too early to tell, because the other nations mentioned, again, um, Turkey, um, Ethiopia, uh, uh, Sudan, you know, other nations that are sort of mentioned around, uh, locally around Israel, they're not really fully pulled into this thing yet. As a matter of fact, by and large, for the most part, most places weren't doing any official reporting on it until overnight into Sunday, our time here in the West. And so, um, but now that everybody is starting to weigh in and facts are starting to unfold, um, I think it will be likely that if Israel officially claims responsibility for that attack, uh, that that will shake the board up a little bit. I think it will it will stir things a bit, and we'll know more about where we stand in regard to Ezekiel's words when that begins to happen. So this is important for us to watch, to pay attention to, uh, because it may be precipitating these events. It's not yet, but I do think that as not just students of prophecy, but as students of Scripture, as followers of Jesus Christ— that we want to be aware and pay attention of the events that are taking place around us because it helps us get a sense of how near we are to God fulfilling his final purposes for, uh, for you know, for, uh, within time and space here on the earth and before he ultimately creates a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, leading up to that period of time prior to those things when, he established, when Christ returns to establish his millennial kingdom. So, um, so do pay attention. You know, it's, there, it is true that there is sort of a coming and going of these events. A few years ago, uh, another group of events really put us on the cusp of watching Ezekiel 38 unfold, um, but then they, they kind of just calmed down. Uh, there have been a number of these things over the years. Uh, things have happened in Russia, things have happened around Israel, things have happened in the Middle East in general that have really gotten people who are looking at what the Word has to say about this stuff kind of perked up and paying attention, and then it calms down. Um, there, 
the reason I really approach this the way that I do is because I, I don't want to put people out on a limb or get people all riled up about something without knowing for sure that this is what it is. I'm always very measured, and I try, I try to be. I try to be. I may not have always succeeded at this, but I try to be very measured in how I portray these things and connect the dots because there are, frankly, lots and lots of voices out there that are jumping up and down saying, here it is, it's time, it's coming, and, and, and Christians just get so wound up and then they calm down, wound up and then they calm down, and there's, there's this burnout that begins to happen. As a matter of fact, um, there's a lot of folks that have been walking with the Lord for a really long time who remember reading Hal Lindsey's uh, The Late Great Planet Earth um, um, when he wrote that back in the 70s. And all these years have gone by, and the things that he talked about in that book have not happened yet. Now, he was, it's a great book, and, and I think he describes a lot of things that are going to happen, but they haven't happened yet. And a lot of believers who sort of were on the edge of their seats for a long period of time uh, during that, uh, in that season have sort of dropped off now and gotten burned out about looking at prophecy or they just sort of assume, well, maybe these things aren't true because they haven't happened yet. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a dangerous thing uh, to, you know, books like 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming in 1988 or something. Or there's, there's a lot of talk about this being a significant year because 2030 is supposed to usher in the millennium and that sort of thing. I've got a couple books on my bookshelf that I, I think, and I started reading them and, and have set them down, but I think that was basically the premise. And so um, you just you just want to be really cautious about doing that for the sake of of just being honest with, with where we are. I'm excited too, but I don't want to necessarily mislead someone by pushing them further on something uh, than, than where we necessarily know for sure we are. Now, if, for example, as a total hypothetical situation, it's within the realm of possibility, suppose Israel claims responsibility and that all of a sudden sets off uh, suddenly now Russia, who probably is not really wanting to get into another major conflict at this point because they're currently in a conflict with Ukraine. This may, by the way, be part of the reason why news is very slow getting out of that region because if, if Russia suddenly now has to come to bat for Iran, against Israel, that begins to stir things up very significantly. And at that point, if we start to see other nations, who, by the way, are sort of beholden to Russia because of a lot of the missile and weapon systems that Russia has provided for them, nations that we just read about in Ezekiel 38, uh, just about all, if not all, of those nations have received, uh, whether it's the S-300 or 400 missile systems, they may have even started receiving more recent developments and upgrades to those things, but they are connected via, uh, you know, at least on that level, they're connected with Russia. And it may very well be that if Russia comes against Israel, claiming to want to put her down because of her, quote unquote, unprovoked attacks against Iran or that kind of thing, um, uh, you know, and again, Israel and Russia already have sort of a, a, a tentative, a tenuous kind of relationship. If that begins to happen and Russia begins to call in these other nations to come and help her in this attack, well, then we know we're in Ezekiel 38. If they come against Israel, start watching for the Lord to begin to start bringing things into this and, 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 and intervene. Um, but until we see those things happen, we want to be a little careful not to jump the gun and get people all wound up and then they come down again. Eventually, you know, for all I know, you know, when Peter talks about those who say, well, where's, the, where's this coming and all this? People have been talking about this and things have been going on like since the fathers. And Peter says, don't be slack, you know, don't, God's not slack the way you and I are. Don't, don't be thinking that way, you know. So, but part of the reason that the world may be thinking that way, and even believers may be thinking that way, is because of getting people so ramped up and then they sort of, you know, it's like a manic, frenetic, crazy thing. And so I just want to be cautious with that. At least I try to be. So uh, where I failed in that, I apologize, but, uh, but that's certainly my aim and I hope to be consistent with that. So that being said, I'll have a couple more links in, uh, in this post that you can look at and uh, see. Um, they're, 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 neither of the links are producing tons of new information because there isn't tons of new information, but it'll give you places to continue to go back to and see as, as more and more becomes known, these sources will become um, helpful in, in reading up on this uh, as they continue to report on it. So um, open your Bible, read Ezekiel 38 and 39. Matter of fact, read Ezekiel 36 through 39 and get a fuller flavor of all that's going on here in, in regard to Israel being in the land in the first place uh, and also what is uh, 
coming down the road for her and the nations around her. And then, of course, you know, take a look at some of these other things and, and uh, become more and more familiar with the story as it unfolds. And, um, and again, try just not to jump the gun, but just look at what's happening. And, uh, and, and believe me, when, when this all comes down and, and we see a whole group of nations coming against Israel, then it'll be time to raise an eyebrow and say, okay, let's, let's take a closer look at this and, and maybe we can stand on more firm footing as far as calling out what it is. So for what it's worth, there's my two cents. But uh, hopefully it's uh, uh, useful and helpful. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's, uh, you know, it ages well. We'll see how things go. But Father, we thank you and praise you for what is coming down the road in regard to seeing your hand at work on behalf of your people Israel, the apple of your eye. We, uh, as Christians, want to support uh, and even bless those um, uh, you know, bless the children of Abraham, even as you said, that uh, you will bless those who bless him and you'll curse those who curse him. And so we want to be mindful of the covenant that you've made in regard to the people, in regard to the land, and a covenant that stands on your faithfulness and not theirs. Uh, we just want to remember that, um, that uh, so much of, of eschatology revolves around uh, your chosen people in this little parcel of land in the Middle East. And so we uh, pray that we'd, uh, you'd remind us of the importance of praying for the peace of Jerusalem, that, uh, Father, while we don't acknowledge everything they do as being up, uh, you know, upright and all, we do recognize that you have chosen them. And, and again, your faithfulness to them is not contingent upon their faithfulness to you. And so we uh, thank you because that sets a great tone, even as Paul said, when it comes to our understanding of your faithfulness toward us. Uh, here in the New Covenant. And so we praise you and bless you for all of this and pray that you would um, bring about your plans and purposes. We don't relish in the fact that there will be wars and bloodshed and, and conflict where um, it's just ugly. War is truly hell, as, the, as, as it's been said. So we don't, we don't look forward to that. But we do know that when it does finally unfold, it just brings us that much closer to you wrapping up man's dominion on the earth and establishing the kingdom that you have invited us to pray for when you told us, Jesus, to pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So thank you, Father. We love you and we praise you and bless you and ask that, Father, you would help us to have a keen eye and ear and, and certainly hearts and minds open to your word uh, to, to be able to see clearly what's going on around us. Thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>